that we have this message purportedly from you and we want to make the most of it. We want it to uh, indelibly change and affect our lives this day and forever. Help us, Lord God, then, to be good listeners, good hearers of your word, and help me to be a good preacher of it too, I guess. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Where do I start? I've got a list of announcements here that I could have added to yours, Michael and Ron, but uh, I'll perhaps keep them to the end. Uh, I just want to look at Philippians 3 again. For a few weeks last year, I was looking at Genesis 15, and I haven't finished with that yet, so just beware. I'll come back to that. By the way, uh, I did offer to let Neil uh, carry on from where he left off last week, but he said he needs a couple of hours, so I thought it might be best for your sake. By the way, he is anticipating a call from Ron to uh, take uh, Wendy's place at the microphone because she'll be away for a couple of weeks. He'll be waiting a long time. <laughs> I said, don't get your hopes up, Neil. He might ask me. But anyway, anyway, uh, we want to get on with it, don't we? And the text is Philippians 3. I turned to this a few weeks ago and then discovered Admiral Craven. And so I shared that video with you. And that uh, phrase from this chapter that uh, we want to share Christ's sufferings. Well, we don't really, do we? But uh, Paul certainly did. So maybe there's a secret of victory in Christ through sufferings. So that's why I shared that, uh, that video showing that life can be pretty tough and uh, if the uh, commanding officer in a recruit training school doesn't spare the rod, so to speak, nor does Jesus Christ think of the suffering that uh, Lou and Pats have gone through the last few weeks. And I understand that that uh, Kim, your mum's got a very severe headache today. Uh, we're very sorry about that. We do have our sufferings and God doesn't step in, snap his finger and say it's alright. But uh, there is a phrase right at the beginning of that chapter that I want to turn in. Well, there's two phrases. One of them is just simply one word. Finally, it's uh, ironic that uh, Paul uses the word finally here because he's only halfway through letter to the Philippians. It reminds me of uh, an Aboriginal preacher who came up from Albury to Sydney when we were living there and he spoke at a Church of Christ conference of some sorts. I can't even remember the context now. But he, his opening words were, you know, it's not true what people say about me being long-winded. I might be long, but I'm never winded. That's <laughs> one for you, Neil. Yeah. Uh, and uh, certainly Paul was like that. Somebody fell out the window, or went to sleep and fell out the window in one of his sermons. So hopefully that won't happen to you this morning. Don't, don't sit near the windows. Uh, but finally, he's saying something important here in the next chapter or two, isn't he? And uh, really, it's under the heading of rejoice. Well, you can't rejoice in every and any circumstance, that's not true. So that would be a pretty cruel statement if that's what he said. But what does he say? Rejoice in the Lord. And that we can do. If the uh, circumstances around us are getting us down, nonetheless, there is the Lord that we can rejoice in. And we can, if we follow the directions of the rest of the chapter, it's a salvation chapter, really. And I've headed up my sermon, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. And uh, we find that uh, further down in uh, Paul's testimony here. He is uh, devoting the next chapter to warning people against holding on to traditions uh, that will perhaps get your salvation if you do them. Well, not so much traditions here as the law of the Old Covenant. The law of the Old Covenant is not going to get you anywhere. In fact, Paul in the next two or three letters, including Galatians, tells us that the law was never meant 
as a salvation package at all. It was only meant to show us that we are sinners, to uh, put a spotlight on who we really are as human beings. We can't measure up to God's standards. Joan and I have been reading through the, uh, the, the Bible again, this is our second time through together in the last two or three years, and how tedious it was reading Leviticus and uh, Numbers 2 for that matter, and now Deuteronomy. I just thank God that I was never born a Jew. But Paul was a true blue Jew. As Stuart Briscoe said up at Mount Bamberine one year when he was speaking, that there was never a truer, bluer Jew than Paul. And he tried with all of his might to keep the law of Moses. And he thought by doing that, he was on the right side of God. Little did he realize while he was doing it that all he was proving was that he was a sinner after all. You only have to read Romans 7 to see the other side of Paul's testimony on that. So no, that's, uh, that's not it at all. Get right down to verse 7 or so. Whatever gain I had, Paul says, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. That's the crux of the matter. It's all about Jesus Christ and making him front, center, and whatever else of your life. I count as loss. I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Well, I wonder if it would have if it wasn't for that, that encounter on the way to Damascus. I don't know what his hammer had broken down or something, and uh, he saw this great flashing light. What was it? Was that right, Ron? Uh, no, he was uh, he was in a pajero, wasn't he? Yeah, wasn't it? Murk, was it? Oh, Murk, yeah. Got the mirror fixed, I noticed. He got his mirror fixed. Uh, he was seeing in a mirror dimly last week, Ron he was. Uh, yeah, he uh, had this encounter, and I guess it takes an encounter like that for people to really get concrete, get full on for Jesus. You've got to meet him. You're going to meet him personally, face to face as it were, as Paul did. And I pray for our neighbours that, uh, yeah, they're struggling at the moment. They need to know Christ. And I guess, not just our neighbours, me, I need to know Christ more and more too. But all that later on in this chapter, I press on, as Paul says, I press on to make it known. But now, verse 8, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In fact, well, I think Jesus told a parable or two about this. You, know, you find uh, a, a treasure and uh, you uh, sell everything you've got to go and recover that treasure. And, you know, I mean, nothing else is worth anything compared to picking up this treasure that is Jesus Christ. I was reading uh, Lyon's Handbook of Science and Christianity during the week, and uh, a mathematician, a physicist, by the name of John Polkinghorne, some of you may have heard that name, John Polkinghorne, uh, he argues that God exercises free will within what we would have to observe as our prior chaotic physical system. Yes, there are laws at work. I've been turned off. I was going to say, Val, that uh, did anybody notice the extra singer this morning? Uh, no, you probably didn't because, you know, the first month, Val, they keep the, they keep the microphone turned down. Did you know that? I did. Yeah. Well, that, that, you know, Renee's turning me off now. In more ways than one. Uh, all right, so uh, count everything as loss. Oh, yes, John Polkinghorne. Thank you. I found my place. Renee, you can carry on now. Thank you. Uh, as Newton discovered, there are laws at work in this universe that God put there. Yes, this, uh, this world does work in an orderly fashion. That's why we can conceive of sending. Just beware, everybody. It's going to get loud. Did do an 
Yeah. <laughs> Try me. I did do an NCO course in the Army, so I don't have to really work a microphone. I can hold an audience. That's not like George Whitfield did, but uh, you know, thousands of coal miners out in the open field. Yeah. Uh, and I've lost my place again, but here we are. Let me quote, let me quote my text. Thank you, Renee. As Newton discovered, there are very predictable and unalterable laws by which this universe operates. There, that's better than what I could have said it in 10 minutes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And yet there is unpredictability, Pokemon points out. There is unpredictability. But I wonder if it's only unpredictability in terms of human observation. I would suggest that our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the creator of the world, is big enough to operate within a chaotic and oft-times unpredictable world. Like the weather. The uh, Tony Auden and Channel 7, he tries to get it right, but you know, the weather comes up the next day and there's nothing quite like what he said was going to happen. Uh, sometimes he does. I, I guess it's a 50-50 gamble, isn't it? Getting the weather right. But I wonder, God is the God of the weather too. In the unpredictable world that we live in, God is still in charge. And uh, he quotes, Hockingham quotes, a 1972 scientist for the name of Edward Lawrence. I've never heard of him before, but he delivered a lecture once entitled Predictability. Does the flap of a butterfly's wing in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? Think about it. The flap of a butterfly wing. Well, indeed, the flap of a butterfly wing does dislodge a bit of pollen, and it pollinates a flower, perhaps. And uh, the flower grows, the seeds fall and grows, and, uh, you know, the effect goes on and on. And then the bulldozers come and knock it all down, and, you know, that too is part of the chaotic, unpredictable universe that Jesus Christ is in control of. I reckon it's pretty good to get Jesus on the side with our lives. So everything else is comparatively worthless, as Paul says, apart from the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord and the Lord of the universe. That last phrase was not in the text, but it's in the New Testament theme as we go from page to page we see that uh, this world is much more orderly than what we observe on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's one thing, that uh, we are in safe hands, we're in good hands when we're in Jesus Christ's hands. Having said that, I think that's rather horrendous. I was reading uh, Adoniram Judson the other day, I was reading about Adoniram Judson, who was an American missionary who went to Burma uh, 200 years ago. But no, he was from America. Uh, I th always thought he was an Englishman because uh, just a couple of weeks ago, one of the field leaders of MECO, Middle East Christian Outreach, by the name of David Judson, died, and uh, we understand that he was a great great grandson or some relative of Adoniram Judson, anyway. So I looked up Adoniram and discovered he had a pretty horrid time in Burma. He was a great linguist, and in fact, some of his work, uh, English, Burmese, Burmese, English, is still in use today. Uh, but uh, it was, he went to Burma at a time when Burma was at war with the Western world. So he wasn't a popular alien in the country. In fact, he was imprisoned. And I read that at one point he was shackled by the ankles and hoisted up so that only his head and shoulders was touching the floor. I don't know how long that went on for, but he did survive. And uh, that's just one example, of course, I get the Open Doors magazine and uh, you read of plenty of uh, horrible cases where the Lord of this universe doesn't stop even his own people
from being bruised by this world, by the worst that this world can do. Nevertheless, Paul says, I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And then you only got to read 2 Corinthians to see what Paul went through as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm going to hurry on. He didn't just say, I want, I count it all as loss. He says in verse 8 that he considers it all rubbish. Now we've got a nice home to live in and we're very thankful for that. We've got a, two nice cars to drive and we've got a caravan as well. What else do you want to know about the Wixes? <laughs> we are blessed. We live for 10 years on a missionary allowance, just month to month, just enough. Well, we had a, a flat provided by the, the mission and then other than that, all we had was enough for food and clothing. Now the Lord has blessed us abundantly. But we need not hold on to these earthly things. And the latest Open Doors magazine was a story or two of uh, Africans who were put their faith in Christ and were immediately kicked out of the house in the middle of the night and uh, had nowhere to go. The Lord uh, obviously would have picked up the pieces and that uh, person, probably through Open Doors or Barnabas Fund or others, are getting on with life. And eventually, people like that do meet other believers and find help. So, really, do we have that attitude that what we have is comparative rubbish compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ? It is profit to be found in Him. Verse 9, let's hurry on. Uh, I don't know where the beginning of the sentence is. With Paul, you never know. But uh, verse 9 says, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. You get that? Don't think that uh, just by feeding the homeless in Caboolture, just by being a good neighbor and everything else, that's good enough. Coming to church on Sunday, that's good enough. No, no, it's not going to cut it at all. Faith in Jesus Christ, the one who uh, who is great to get to know, great to have on your side, standing alongside us in the circumstances of life, a righteousness that depends on faith in Christ, and it doesn't say it here. Well, it does. Let me it. Perhaps it does. Verse ten that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That's good. I'm looking forward to that. Who wants to go to a Christless eternity? Who wants to go to an eternity where you just drift in... I don't know. What happens when we die if we don't know Christ? It doesn't bear thinking about, does it? We need to know him uh, because this life is going to end sooner or later and we better have our profit and loss column in credit on the right side before we have to face that, as Lou did the other day. And uh, we only trust that Lou is ready by comparison with our neighbor here. That's another story. What happens when we die without Christ? Well, Paul wasn't going to die wondering, was he? He was going to do everything in his power to know this Christ and the power of his resurrection the resurrection life, the new life, the uh, life that has a new set of values. I trust that that's your, uh, that your testimony is mine. And may share his sufferings. Paul wouldn't have minded, in the gospel sense anyway, of being strung up by the ankles and left hanging there all day, just with his head and shoulders on the pavement. I think he went through worse than that at times, and I think I read the story of the Richard Wormbrands of this world and what they had put up with. Ah, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and share his sufferings, becoming like him in death. Oh, that's not nice. I saw the Passion of Christ a few years ago with Mel Gibson, you know that one? 
and that was too graphic for me. I watched it, but if that's what Christ went through, yeah, I don't like this phrase at all. <laughs> Becoming like him in his death, that I may by any means possible attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's the goal. Uh, so it's a getting on side with the Creator and getting on side with the Saviour. That's a good place to be, don't you think? Let's do business with the Saviour this morning. In fact, I'll just read the rest of the chapter and then conclude with an Alan Mayle quote. He says, this is Paul's testimony, not that I have already, verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. That's comfort, that's consolation. Me, a wretch that I am. Brothers, I don't consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who, have, who are mature think this way. I trust, looking around the room, that should be pretty well all of us. I think we've been walking the walk with Christ for quite a while. Uh, and if anyone should think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only um, let us hold true to what we have obtained. Brothers, join in imitating me. I stand before the pulpit and say this too, rather in trepidation, but uh, I do my best. Not to do my best to gain uh, salvation by being a good boy, but by being a good follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you get my drift. And I think that's what Paul is saying here too. For many of whom I have told you, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. They're in this destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. So, uh, I you think of those who make that profession of faith, and uh, within a few weeks or months, they're no longer attending church fellowship. They're no longer at prayer meetings. They're no longer walking with the Lord. <clears throat> but if their citizenship was truly in heaven, I guess they would be. That's the difference. He who perseveres to the end will be saved. <laughs> Let's persevere to the end. This is the Alan Mayle quote. And I don't know where he quoted it, but uh, Joan and I have been uh, reminiscing in recent days. We are uh, we're, we're the poorer for not having kept diaries when we were in the Middle East. I'm writing our story because people have often asked. And of course we've got children and grandchildren who ought to know a little bit about their mum, their grand, grandma, granddad. Uh, so I'm writing our story, but then I scratch my head. Now, what really happened there? If I had a diary, I could check it out. You keep diaries? We do now. And uh, uh, just a few years ago, Jane started writing things down. And one of them was an Alan Mail quote. You'll have to ask her where she got it from. But this is what, what he said. And I conclude with this thought. If Jesus was in charge in an average congregation, There'd only be a few left there on Sunday morning. If Jesus were greeting newcomers, he might say, are you absolutely sure you want to follow this way of life? It will take everything you have. It has to come before everything that matters to you. Plenty of people have launched out without counting the cost, and as you can see, they're not here now. There were at least 10 attempts to kill me, the Lord Jesus is quoting the Lord Jesus. There were at least 10 attempts to kill me before I went to the cross. There's a cost, a cross, a commitment, and then a crown. Amen. <laughs>